I would declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Did you notice the capital S? This is a prophecy by the psalmist who's speaking as if he is the Messiah. A lot, the book of Psalms does this a lot. G messianic Psalms, Psalms about a Messiah. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Look at this, next verse. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Ask of me, and I will give you, capital Y. Ask, son, this is God talking, son to Jesus, to, to the Christ. Ask me, and I'll give you the nations for an inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So can you see that as early as Psalms 2, Christ's inheritance starts to be listed as the rest of the world. Let's go back to step one. What's God's inheritance? Israel. He's got his own people. He quarters them off and gives them a law, sort of like a fence, so that they'll be safe in the middle of a world that's against them and they have no inheritance. They don't have an inheritance yet. They are God's inheritance, right? And then God says, I'm going to move into the timeline. I'm going to send my son. Jesus is going to be the, the spitting image of his daddy. Right? He's going, to, he's going to look like me, talk like me. Act. I'm going to be, it's really God moving into human form, by the way. It's not just that God had a kid running around in heaven and he went, oh, get down there on earth. No, no, no. We, we get some crazy ideas because people go, God had a kid. Who was the mom? The reality is, is that God moved into the timeline of humanity and called it the Son of God. That's why Jesus and the Father are the same person. And so God moves into the form of Jesus and gives, him, gives an inheritance as a son. And that inheritance, remember we had a fence. Israel's in that fence. Christ inherited, ask of me and I'll give you the inheritance of what? I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. And the ends of the earth as your possession. So what's Christ's inheritance? The whole thing. So you got... You got Israel fenced in up here on the globe. I, I can't make a big globe. So we got, imagine a big globe. Israel's fenced in on the globe. That's God's inheritance. Like, I'm going to move through this. He drops himself into the middle of that and then says, I'm going to give you everything outside of that fence for your inheritance. How are we going to go get that? That's why John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. See, that's so offensive out there. Outside that fence of Israel, it's so offensive. So Jesus comes and pays for the offense of sin. So that God can move outside of his inheritance into the land of the heathen. Is anybody else as, as thrilled about this as me? I, I mean, I, maybe I'm underselling it or something. Maybe I should be moonwalking and, and uh, you know, whatever I need to do. I, and, and I know it's a heady concept, but it's really the basic fundamentals of who we are as Christians. Is that God said, you know what, I'm not happy just having Israel. I want the whole ball. You know, I look out here and I see it hanging here in the solar system. I want the whole thing back. I don't want the guy in Africa and Japan and South America and North America. I don't want him to feel separated from me. I want to go down there and pay for him too. I want to pay for the Chinese and the Korean and the African in the bush. And I want to pay for the wealthy guy in the palaces of Europe. And I want to pay for the, for the uh, all of them. Name them off. All the cultures, all the people for all time. They're never going to be able to save themselves so I want to go save them. I want all of them for my inheritance. That's Christ. Amen. What an awesome thing. And here's, how, here's why he did it. Next screen. Hebrews 12 and 2. I know I used this verse a couple weeks ago. Please forgive me for going back to it. But there's something in it that I, I want to give you today that we might not have had time to really cover that, that Sunday. And I want to show you that Christ's inheritance was built in this right here. Look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. We all know this. Watch this line though. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That's the part I want you to catch. Why did Jesus endure the cross? Remember, God's got his little people, him then here in a fence. We've got the Mosaic law around him, right? And then Jesus drops in right in the middle of that. And he says in Psalms 2, if you'll ask me, I'll give you the rest of it for an inheritance. And so Jesus wants it. That's why he goes to the cross. I'm, I'm going to buy them all back, Father. I want them all. Israel rejects me, but I'm going to go get the rest of the world. Why did he do it? This scripture tells me, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So God let him see his full inheritance and said, if you'll go to the cross, I'll give you all of it. For the joy, I hope you realize, what was the joy set before him? And please don't say resurrection, because that was not the joy set before Jesus. You're the joy set before Jesus. He saw that he gets it all. 
And for the joy set in front of him, he said, I'll endure anything, Daddy. Put me on that cross. I'll take it for them all. Because it's going to be such a joy for them to be mine and me to be theirs. For the joy set in front of Jesus, he endured everything the cross had. He endured all of the flame of judgment. It was Jesus who knew exactly what he was going into. And he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He knew he was going to be, have to be judged. He knew he was going to have to be cursed. He knew it going into it. That's why he said, I've got to be just like that snake in the wilderness. If I'm going to set these people free from the snake bite and the venom of sin and death, I'm going to have to go endure it. And there's nothing in the world that makes you want to walk into that except the joy of knowing what you get if you do. Now, why would you jump in front of a truck that's going 70 mile an hour out here on the highway? No good logical reason. You have to save your own life. It's built inside of your DNA unless there's somebody standing in front of that truck that means more to you than your own heartbeat. And then you don't even think about it. You just go push them out of the way. And the last thing you do is know that they're safe. And why would you do that? For the joy set in front of you of knowing that if you just push them, they can go change the world even though you're not here anymore. And that's enough of a joy for you to go sacrifice your own life and limb for the people that matter the most to you. And there's nothing more important for us to know than that day at Calvary. The whole reason he died is he was so passionately in love with the idea, not just of saving you from your sins. He was so passionately in love with the idea of having you as his inheritance when he comes out of that grave. It was not just about beating sin. It was about living in you. And for the joy of getting to live in you and go to your work and live in your house and go to your school and be who you are, for that joy, he said, Daddy, I'll take it all. If there's any other way to save him, let's do it. But if not, just let me see what I get. I got to believe that in Gethsemane, when he's praying and he's sweating great drops of blood, and three times in Gethsemane, he says, Dad, if this cup can pass for me, let it pass. In the book of Luke, three times. If this cup can pass, let it pass. And we always say, well, Jesus just went right in. He just did whatever God said. But three times he said, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, let it pass. That tells me that Jesus was looking. If there's another way out, let's do it. And I think every time what dropped in front of his spirit was us. Amen. Because Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy that was set before him. That means the Father dropped in front of him. Here's what you get. Son, if you do it, here's what you get. And you think he's ticked off. With you all the time. I'm, I'm, real, I'm doing this for a reason. You think he's mad at you all the time. And I say to you for the joy that was set in front of him. And you are that joy. For the joy that was set in front of him. He gladly endured whatever they had for him at Calvary. Amen. Gladly endured it. Why? Because he knew if I can just endure this. I get him. And nobody can ever take him away from me. I'm going to get them in my hand and I'm going to hold on to them. No matter what, it's for the joy of knowing them and them knowing me. And for any one of them who will believe on me, I'll let them become the sons of God.